Okay, we're back. We're live. Policy for the people today. You have the benefit of co-hosts today. Our regular host on the show is Menorah Mordecai, and I'm stepping in as her co-host. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the one o'clock block, and we're going to talk about um, Roe v. Wade. And the title of our show is Roe v. Wade Hasn't Been Overturned here on Policy for the People. We're talking about national policy. We're talking about important national policy. Welcome to your show, Minara. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. It's good to be back on my show. And thanks for joining me as a co-host. This is going to be an exciting discussion. Yes, it is. So why do you say uh, Roe v. Wade hasn't been overturned? A lot of people feel that the Supreme Court has really thrown some cold water on it. Yeah. And in, in effect, it has overturned it. What do you think? I mean, effectively in the state of Texas, uh, abortion has become virtually illegal, right? Um, something like 85% of the abortions are not illegal in, in the state of Texas. And I think um, a lot of times we as lawyers, we forget that for most people, they don't have necessarily the foundational understanding of federal versus state um, legislative process. So even, for example, if the court takes up this case and overturns Roe versus Wade, that doesn't mean that the entire country will all of a sudden stop having abortion. So that's the first point that I want to make is that this is going to be state by state process. Whatever happens with Roe versus Wade, each state will determine for themselves what they decide to do with abortion. That doesn't make it OK, but um, it's not going to place a ban on abortions nationally. Couldn't they do that? Couldn't they ban abortions and say there is a right to life all over the country? It's a constitutional right by the fetus, and therefore no state can allow abortions. Can't they say that? But that's not the argument that they're making, right? The argument they're making is that um, the abortions are being enforced by private citizens. Right, so, but the Supreme Court is ultimately going to rule on the substance of this in the Mississippi case, mm -hmm. right? Which is another another case in the South, so to yeah. speak. And and you know whether it's a direct uh, decision or a dictum, we um, got a majority there, easy majority that that could easily say no, there is no right to life. I mean, the, rather, there is no right to choice. There's only a right to life. And every fetus has a right to life, and we're not. We, we and we feel that every abortion um, is subject to that constitutional provision. I, I don't think the argument in this case, even the Mississippi case, is not based on the right to life. It's based on right to privacy. So what people are defending is the right to privacy equals the right to have an abortion. There and you know, truthfully, outside of search and seizures, there is no right of privacy that's been articulated in the Constitution itself. But the court, over the period of its jurisprudence, has defend, defined what that means to have a right of privacy as a citizen. Part of that is having a right to an abortion. Private part of it is having a right to. Um, uh, you know, same-sex marriage and all of these things were deemed as a right to privacy. So for the court to take up that case, the Mississippi case, what they can do is they say that abortion does not equal privacy, in which case it takes away the constitutional protection of abortion. But then each state would still have its own laws. So, um, someone would have to then take Hawaii to sue the state of Hawaii for its law that allows abortion to happen and then take it up to the Supreme Court. So then, I mean, it may continue on and on for a long period of time, but each state would have to be sued for its existing laws. But that's that's future. We're talking about hypothetically. Well, right? I mean, one of the things that that has come out of the Texas uh, statute, which we can talk about in a minute, mm -hmm. um, is that other states may also adopt statutes. Maybe they won't have the same, mm -hmm. you know, vigilante yeah. mechanism, which is troublesome. But mm -hmm. you know, some other some other kind of anti-abortion statute. Mm -hmm. um, and if the Supreme Court at some point says no, those statutes are okay, that's okay. Uh, then every state uh, that wants to do that can do that, and that'll be final in that state. Yeah. Be yeah. final, be the end of the ballgame. Yeah. 
Um, and, and even now, I believe you can tell me more uh, that, that a number of states are either um, doing that, Republican states are either doing that or they're planning to do that uh, in, you know, in, in the hopes that they can get um, the Supreme Court to um, allow them to do that. Um, mm -hmm. but, I mean, what are your thoughts about the future of this deal? The Supreme Court is anti-abortion right now, majority. If they it get a chance, like they're going to knock it off. Whether it's privacy or anything else, they're going to knock it off. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about that? I, you know, I don't know 100% that that's going to be the case, honestly. Um, they did leave room for surprise. So they may take up a case and rule it on very narrow grounds, which won't necessarily allow um, every state to go in and pass the same kind of law, which we've seen them done in the past where they go in and they don't necessarily want to change the law broadly, where they deem something as constitutional or not constitutional on very narrow grounds that only applies to this particular case. That may be what will happen with um, either when Texas statute goes up to the Supreme Court or when the Mississippi case gets heard. The okay. other part of that is um, each state may pass its own set of laws that bans abortion. So it's gonna become a, the battle will probably shift from the ju um, judicial grounds to legislative grounds, right? We have two separate ways that law is made. And so far, uh, um, Abortion has been politicized enough where it's become uh, the judges and the courtrooms have become the battleground for abortion. Um, if Roe versus Wade gets overturned, we, we probably would see the battle shifting to legislative processes where people will push for state legislation to protect abortion. And, um, and states have a lot of rights to legislate how the well-being of their citizens, um, like something as health education has been traditionally um, in the hands of the state legislature. So it's going to be a state by state battle, I believe. Yeah, yeah. a Republican versus Democrat state, right? Yeah. And what about uh, Joe Biden's idea, or the people have suggested it to him anyway, um, of codifying Roe v. Wade in the Congress? Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that, that is a, a legal constitutional mm -hmm. possibility to do that, essentially override anything the Supreme Court might do if, if it's yes. codified in the Congress. <clears throat> but, um, you know, what we know today does not give us optimism about that. What do you think? You think it's possible? I think so. I think that's probably going to be... Um... I don't know if it's going to be an effective strategy, but it is a doable strategy, especially if there is um, organizing both from as a grassroots level organizing and politically, if there is um, buy in. And right now we have the momentum where a lot of people are outraged about what's going on in Texas. So there may be a buy in to have a federal uh, law passed. Um, of course, the Senate composition would have to change for that to happen. But yes, if it's codified in the, as a federal law, then the, this nationally, we would have protection for abortion or for women's right to choose on a national level. Um, whether that's gonna get sued and go, you know, get it jumped back to the Supreme Court, I don't know, but that's the way our you know, processes work where it, there's a checks and balances where whatever law is passed, the court has a right to review it and back and forth. Um, now, going back to your original question, why Roe versus Wade hasn't been overturned yet, and I want to explain a little bit what happened with the deadline on September 1st. Um, the court decided not to stop the law from going into effect. So as far as Texas is concerned that law went into effect and the abortion became illegal after I believe it's six weeks. Now someone can still um, file a lawsuit against that law as being unconstitutional and then it will go back to the Supreme Court in which case they can decide on the merits and whether this law is constitutional or not. Mm -hmm. And that's what it means that Roe versus Wade hasn't been overturned yet. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm sure somebody is either filing or thinking about filing that suit. To, I'm sure, uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a natural. 
But you know, going back to the Supreme Court, and then we'll, we should visit the exact statute. Um, seems to me that um, you know nothing is so constant as change itself, and it's possible. If I'm a Republican strategist, I would say it's, it's possible that um, that the uh, Roe v. Wade doctrine will be codified in Congress. It's possible, and if there's a change, as you said, in Congress, that makes it maybe more likely. It's possible that uh, Joe Biden will find a way, uh, or his successor, um, will find a way to add judges to the Supreme Court, change the composition. Um, it's possible uh, that there'll be other judges because of death or retirement on the Supreme Court, even in the, in the short term, uh, who will be more liberal and change the makeup and change the vote. Um, and uh, that, would, that would be interesting. Remember, the next appointments that are made, at least uh, while he's president, are made by Biden. Remember also that Mitch McConnell is going to oppose any uh, uh, appointment by Biden. I mean, that's, yes. a, that's a whole other show. Um, but what I'm saying is this changes, uh, all kinds of changes that are possible. And if I'm a Republican strategist, I say to myself, if we're going to kill Roe v. Wade, we got to do it now. We don't want to be subject to the, the possibility of mm, environmental changes mm -hmm. all around the government, all around the court. Uh, so let's find a case soon. Let's take the case. Let, let's give it cert. Uh, let's get our hands on it and let's let's kill Roe v. Wade before before we can't. Uh, don't you agree that there's a moment in time here where they have to focus if that's what they want to do? Yes, probably um, right now if people are emboldened by what's going on in Texas and the fact that the Supreme Court, or at least the majority of the Supreme Court, um, allowed for the law to, to go into effect. They didn't say that the law was constitutional and that's an important distinction. They just said the law may go into effect because the way it is written, it is distinct enough where we're not gonna um, ban it outright. We're gonna decide it um, on its constitutionally on its merits once it, it is heard. I don't agree with that decision because in effect, um, it didn't uphold the spirit of the law. And I know you as an attorney, you, you know the spirit of the law is something that we learn about in law school a lot, where we have to kind of step back and think the purpose of the law, the intent of it, what was it uh, meant to do and protect. So the Supreme Court's decision didn't uphold the spirit of the of Ververs versus Wade. Well, I think they knew what they were doing. Yeah. They wanted it to take effect. <clears throat> and they wanted to send a signal to other states. Try it. Try it. You'll see if you like it. <clears throat> but let's let's talk about the the law itself. Um, where in the world did this come from? You know, I mean, this is very similar in my mind to the voting rights, the voting suppression legislation that came out of the very same state, one of the biggest states in the country, which apparently is run by Republicans right now. But how did this happen? Because there's so many public policy reasons that fly in favor of abortion and mm -hmm. against um, this, this law. So yeah. we'll, and we'll talk about the terms and we'll talk about the mechanisms in a minute. But you know, what drives uh, so many people um, to, 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 to want a law like this? Uh, I sent you a copy of Linda Greenhouse's article, um, you know, pointing out that the, Linda Greenhouse is my sister-in-law, and she writes about the Supreme Court for the New York Times, has been doing that for 30 years, maybe 40. Um, and she pointed out a very salient point that um, we, have, we have come to a time in the nation's history where r religion seems to govern the law in many instances, and probably in this instant. Um, and so how much do you think is religion behind this? How much do you think Trumpism is behind this? How much do you think old fashioned conservatism is behind this? Uh, what, what drives people to want to knock off abortion in a state so big? You got to figure it out because it's a major event nationally. I think it, it actually became, it goes back well before Trump was even in, in our, on our horizon. Um, and we've seen it happen with other issues where um, a party or a platform, um, a party is seeking a platform to get ahead in the polls and they're going to politicize an issue 
um, that shouldn't really be political to begin with. It should be an entirely um, a medical decision or something that a community decides for them, you know, um, how they choose to set up the, the health clinics or something like that. They became political the way education became political um, during the segregation era, during the Brown versus Board of Education. We saw how politicians, specifically conservative politicians, were using it as scare tactic as a, an infringement on an American way of life. Is this racist um, then? Is this law out of Texas really another expression of racism? Partially, it could be racism, but partially, I think it's more of a um, the scare attack, this fear of like of having people's religion and religious rights being taken away. It's seen as an infringement on the religious right, on the Christian right specifically, because we see the push from the um, Christian um, conservatives, um, and that to me is what's driving abortion on a political level. Um, and that that's that's become kind of decades in the making of using that as a scare tactic, protect our religion, protect American Christianity, protect our religious freedoms by voting for this person or that person by pushing ahead of one party over another. If you vote for us, we're going to ensure that we're going to protect your religious rights. We saw that with it's like with school, it was to, you know, we're going to make sure that white schools will remain white if you vote for the Republican Party. So, so there's politicization a corruption there, isn't there? It's a corruption of religion and it's a corruption of politics. You know, there was a piece in the paper, I think it was in the Times this morning, it might have been in Washington Post, uh, which talked about a practice that has been growing up in the South where if you want a written exemption from taking a vaccine, you go to a certain church, which you never belonged to before, and you join the church and you give them money. Upon receipt of the money, they give you a letter saying you're exempt from the, vac from the requirement for a vaccine. So, I mean, that's, that's a fantastic corruption. Uh, it's yeah. transactional to use that term. Um, so when we talk about religion these days, it's a pretty vague concept and anything goes, don't you think? Well, yes, and religion should be a personal choice. If you choose to practice something, you choose to have or not have an abortion, that should be a personal choice. There's no room for it to be imposed on anybody else. Those practices of beliefs shouldn't be on, imposed on anyone else. That's why we have freedom of religion. You, you're free to practice your own. It doesn't mean you should be telling others how to practice their religious beliefs. And instead it's being used politically and you brought up a good example of vaccination right now. Um, you would think something like COVID, a public health crisis should not be political, but it's being used politically by certain um, parties, agencies, and they're pushing an agenda to maintain their platform using COVID or anti-vaccine as, um, as their argument to build support. Yeah, and religion, is yeah. pushing anti-vax. I mean, uh, how did they get involved in that? This is we're talking about saving life, but apparently yeah. that's not too important to some, maybe many of, of the religions involved. But let's go I mean, back if to you, the, if you say it enough times over YouTube, you keep saying anti-vaccination is anti-religious, then people will start believing it and they're going to start repeating it, and it becomes reality for them. And we have right now the proliferation of YouTube and other platforms where anyone can speak without experience or you know, background in public health. And if you have enough people who are speaking their lay opinions, then it becomes a reality for that group that follows them. So let's talk about uh, vigilantism, which is, mm -hmm. a, you know, I, I got to give credit to those guys in the uh, in the Republican Party in the Texas legislature. Um, the, the, they're doing a, a terrific job on suppressing voting, uh, especially among minorities, black and brown people. But but the one uh, the one that really sticks in your craw for the year and maybe all of time is, is the vig vigilantism in this abortion uh, statute. And it does remind you of um, of kids telling on their parents 
of rel relatives telling on their relatives of what was going on in Nazi Germany with the Gestapo um, back in the 30s. It does remind you of that when you have people turning in other people. Um, and in this case, it's even more gross because you get money. Uh, yeah. in, in Nazi Germany, you wouldn't necessarily get money. Here they yeah. are offering you a $10,000 payment, make you happy. Um, where does that come from? Um, it's very creative, isn't it? I actually, I don't think it's creative. I think it's... Um there is enough people in the legislature, in Texas leg legislature, to push forward and create something that many other groups have thought of and tried to do. They just didn't have enough political buy-in to do it. I mean, um, there are a number of civil rights groups who would have loved to sue anyone for any hate crime, but they didn't have the ability to do that because the courts would say you don't have standing. And standing has been such an important part of civil procedure and civil litigation. And of course, I mean, think about civil rights era, how far we would have come if we could have had this kind of enforcement where every time you see a hate crime, you can sue without showing injury. People just didn't have that political buy-in to do it. So, the creativity is not there. It's the fact that um, they're, what they're doing is just going against tradition, against the established jurisprudence. And standing has been an important part of American courts because we want to discourage frivolous lawsuits. So you have to show injury when you're bringing a civil lawsuit. And if you're bringing a frivolous civil lawsuit and it gets thrown out, a lot of times the person you're suing should be able to recover their legal fees from you because this would discourage frivolous lawsuits. What this statute in Texas does, it prohibits defendants from seeking legal fees. So without any kind of justification, if I was that vigilante in Texas, I can sue five of the richest people I know saying they aided and abetted the abortion. And in order for them not to pay for lawyers and all of that, they would just settle with me for $500, let's say. So you actually don't need any grounds to file a lawsuit. You can literally do settlements left and right. And that's, that's what I feel like if people are smart enough to figure out, that's what they're going to be started doing because um, they can't be sued for or they can't be um, held liable for fr frivolous lawsuits. They file a claim, go to the person and say, hey, I just sued you. If you give me $500, I'll dismiss a complaint and they will go away. In other times, that would be extortion, wouldn't it? <laughs> so now, um, you know, Merrick Garland is, uh, is, uh, is woke on this and he's going after Texas on this uh, statute. Uh, how, how successful do you think he's going to be in, in setting it aside? Um, I don't think it will be successful, honestly, because it's a state legislature. I think it would have to, there was sufficient, I mean, the, the way the law is written, the fact that no one has written, um, has made an objection to the standing issue, to um, um, the fact that the certain defenses were prohibited, the fact that you can't reclaim attorney fees, even if it was a frivolous lawsuit. There's just so many things about it that feels wrong and um, completely contrary to what we know of civil um, litigation. Um, just setting aside the abortion issue alone, I'm saying that this law is so poorly written that whoever wrote it is not going to budge on any logical constitutional grounds. But right now you have, we have, we all have Roe v. Wade. It's still mm -hmm. the law of the land. This statute in Texas flies in the face of Roe v. Wade. And um, Merrick Garland is saying, or should be saying, um, that the statute is unconstitutional because the Supreme Court has waited on this issue in 1973 and they can't just toss Roe v. Garland away in the state of Texas make that Roe v. Wade away in the state of Texas. Um, isn't he right if he makes that argument? I think so, but I'm not on the Supreme Court. So it really... <laughs> <laughs>
Maybe, I mean, you're maybe gonna... you should be. The Supreme <laughs> Court would be far better off now. <laughs> I'll take that as a great compliment. Um, the, I mean, it should be, but you're going to have an army of constitutional law scholars that will claim that this Texas statute is unconstitutional, but that won't change who's sitting on the court and how they're going to make that decision. If anything is going to have a um, sufficient enough claim, at least at the Texas level, is if the mayor of Mayor Garland claims that the standing, the lack of standing or the lack of injury for the plaintiff in that law is unconstitutional according to the Texas Constitution. So if the Texas Constitution states that in order to bring a civil lawsuit, you have to show injury, then this statute now becomes unconstitutional, not on an abortion issue, but on a civil procedure issue um, and can be thrown out that way. And wouldn't, I hope, it be, wouldn't that be a matter for the Texas Supreme Court, though, if, if there was an, an argument that it was in violation of the Texas Constitution? Yes, it would be. It would go up to the Texas Supreme Court. Well, let's talk about um, let's talk about this case um, in Massachusetts. Um, it's the uh, I got to find it again. I had it on my. Uh, yeah, Grendel. it's a Grendel Grendel's yeah. Den case in Cambridge, early 80s, I think. Larry Tribe, Lawrence Tribe, represented mm -hmm. the Grendel's Bar, um, and it didn't have a liquor license. They applied for a liquor license, and there was a statute or an ordinance uh, in in, uh, in in Boston um, indicating that if a church stepped up and um, said we don't want a liquor license within a certain distance of the church, that was a, a summary decision, and and the bar could not get a liquor license. It wasn't like a question of zoning. Mm -hmm. It was a question of the church says no, no liquor license based on geography. Um, that was pretty heavy. And um, Lawrence Tribe took it up on behalf of Grendel. It went to the Supreme Court of the United States, this little wee bar, is a really tiny bar. Uh, <laughs> see, that's it's a great country, right? Um, and he won. And for the proposition that the state cannot delegate discretionary mm -hmm. governmental uh, decisions um, to anyone, including a church, and um, that's that's good law today. How yeah. does that how does that affect the Texas law? I would hope that it would be applied when this law is heard on its merits. That the state delegated its responsibility to ordinary citizens and has deputized them to be um, vigilantes, which if that law is still good, if that case is still good, then it should be a precedent for the, uh, for, um, to overturn the Texas um, statute. Well, I guess we're looking at a, yeah. a national momentum, a national trend, a national movement against abortion. Um, but looking at the larger picture of it, uh, here, we only have a few minutes left, Minara. Um, I, I want to tell you a short story, and then I'd like you to comment on how that may fit. Uh, when I was in college, um, in our social group, there was a couple that were dating, and um, she got pregnant, and abortion was not possible. And they were worried that their families, both sides of the, both families, would throw them out of the house and that they wouldn't be able to continue in school and their lives would be wrecked. And in the circumstances, that was a legitimate concern back, back when. So they went down to the dockyards in Brooklyn in a, in, a, in, a, in a tenement house and found a woman who would do it with a coat hanger. And, um, you know, the, the young lady might have died I mean, everybody expected she wind up in the hospital, but luckily she didn't. Um, and I guess it left an impression on me and everyone I knew how wrong it was to either you know, present these people with the, um, the Sophie's choice of either A, um, being, you know, uh, exercised and sent away and lose, lose their education, educational benefits, possibilities, uh, or B, subjecting themselves to death, the risk of a 
horrible disease and and all sort of the possibility that she might never be able to have a child again so um this was always troubling to everyone i knew in my world and uh when roe v wade came around which was only maybe five or ten years after that um we were all gratified to see that there was enlightenment in the country but you know there were others who didn't feel that way mm. what is the best national policy here um and is this is this policy, which actually punishes minorities, uh, going to lead to, that is the anti-abortion policy, going to lead to a better nation, a better workforce, a better mm, 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 social justice, uh, or the other way around? Honestly, I think abortion is ultimately a health issue. It shouldn't be left up to vigilantes or anyone else. I think it should be up to the doctors to decide um, when it's okay to perform um, a procedure. It, it is ultimately a medical procedure and it's a decision. It's a very private personal decision for a woman to, to go through a medical procedure and ultimately should be staying out of, it, there's no room for politics when it comes to medical pro procedures like this. And um, I do think the country and overall, specifically women, would be better off. And to, to tell, to add to the story, I know we're almost out of time, but my professor in law school once told me the reason why she went to law school was because Roe versus Wade became law, where she knew that she had the security to go to law school, to be a lawyer and not be unexpectedly pregnant and drop everything. And that kind of changed my entire perspective of how it affected people on a very personal level. Um, she was in front of me, she was a prominent attorney and, and a, a scholar and a professor and it changed her trajectory dramatically. So that's what happens when um, cases are decided at that high level of Supreme Court. So we'll see what happens next. Yeah, and one last question Minara is this. This, this issue is not the only issue that's on the table for this country right now. There are other issues that are profoundly important in terms of you know, the management of our society, let's put it that way. Um, and it, it all seems to be going the wrong way. Um, people argue the Supreme Court is the wrong way, um, that Congress is dysfunctional, um, that as a result, uh, the executive branch is ham hamstrung in so many ways. Um, and the states are mm, turning Republican and turning mean. Um, so the question I put to you is in, in our, what do you want to call it, our wounded democracy, our injured democracy, nobody will argue to the contrary on that. Um, what can we do? What can the individual do? Uh, what can women who are concerned about this do? You, you're not on the Supreme Court yet, Minara. And you're not in Congress yet, and you and you have not been elected president yet. You're just an ordinary person on a talk show here in Hawaii. Day. What can you do? What can I do? Well, one, we can speak about it. We can have honest conversations and seek expertise from people who should have more to say about it than just um, someone, you know, with very little understanding of law, of constitution, and of, of medical procedures. So um, just seeking more information and ensuring that we um, stay open to new ideas, we can converse openly and um, politely, hopefully. And um, I, I feel like that that's probably our only remedy. I mean, change doesn't happen overnight. But we're going to have we're going to keep having these conversations. And if it mobilizes people to get up and change some of the laws, either through voting or becoming or, or running for office, that's more power to them. I hope it will. Yeah, running for office. OK, um, I'll be encouraging you to do that, Minara. Thank you. <laughs> we should run for office. We should make damn sure to vote and we should write and speak. Mm -hmm. and participate in the public conversation about this. Those are our mm -hmm. options. Uh, there are probably more if you think about it, but those, those are the things we can do and we need to do them on ThinkTech and otherwise. Thank you, Minara. It's been Thank great you. to talk with you. Minora Mordecai, 
uh, here on policy for the people. So important we have this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. It's great to talk to you. Great to be co-host with you. <laughs> uh, me too. Aloha.